We are here in Nurses Hall at the Massachusetts State House, July 1st, 2015, and we want to pay honor to the memory of a lesser known founding father, but a very significant one, by the name of James Otis. And what you see here, uh, painted that's on the top of the uh, walls here at the Nurses Hall, is a, uh, a painting depicting James Otis giving his famous Writs of Assistance uh, speech, his opposition to the Writs of Assistance. Now, the Writs of Assistance were some odious legislation that was passed by the, uh, by, the call, by the governor, and it gave the right of any British officer uh, the, the right to uh, search and seize anything in anyone's homes or businesses. This was, of course, very uh, contrary to, uh, to the law itself. And, and I'm just going to read the comments here. James Otis making his famous argument against the writs of assistance in the old town house in Boston, February 1761. Otis is represented at the moment when he was saying, I will do my dying day oppose with all the power and faculties God has given me, all such instruments of slavery on the one hand and villainy on the other as this writ of assistance is. The room is flooded with a flickering light from the great open fire, while through the windows against which the snow has drifted comes the cold blue light of the late afternoon of that winter's day. John Adams, who actually was at, at present at the time, in a letter to William Tudor, written 56 years after the event, gives his recollection of the scene in front as follows. The scene is the council chamber in the old townhouse in Boston. In this chamber, round a great fire, were seated five judges with Lieutenant Governor Hutchinson at their head, as Chief Justice all arrayed in their new, fresh, rich robes of scarlet English broadcloth and their large cambric bands in immense judicial wigs. In the corner of the room must be placed as a spectator, an auditor, wit, sense, imagination, genius, pathos, reason, prudence, eloquence, learning an immense reading, hanging by the shoulders on the crutches, two crutches covered with a great cloth coat, in the person of Mr. Pratt, who had been solicited on both sides, but he would engage on neither being as Chief Justice of New York about to leave Boston forever. But Otis was a flame of fire, with a promptitude of classical illusions, a depth of research, a rapid summary of historical events and dates, a profusion of legal authorities, a prophetic glance of his eye into eternity, and a torrent of impetuous eloquence. He hurried away everything before him. American independence was then and there born. The seeds of patriots and heroes were then and there sown. Every man of a crowded audience appeared to me to go away, as I did, ready to take arms against writs of assistance. Then and there was the first scene of the first act of opposition to the arbitrary claims of Great Britain. Then and there the child of independence was born. In 15 years, namely in 1776, he grew up to manhood and declared himself free. The writs of assistance were general search warrants which allowed the king's officers to enter warehouses or dwellings to search for and seize foreign merchandise on which a duty had not been laid. These writs were first petitioned for Massachusetts, their legal legality was questioned, and the matter was brought up before a court held in the townhouse as described. And of course, uh, the Fourth Amendment of the U.S. Constitution was something that uh, Mr. Otis could be credited for. He ended up, he uh, was not of sound mind at times, some suggest it was a beating he received at the hands of a tax collector in 1769, but he did have some, uh, some bouts of um, erratic behavior. Some say it may have been something called bipolar, but in those days they didn't know what it was. Although he did have times of clarity. Indeed, he was, uh, at the time he was living in Danvers, Massachusetts, which is on Boston's North Shore, he actually marched at Bunker Hill, on, pretty much on his own, borrowed a neighbor's musket and fought at Bunker Hill. And uh, he told his sister that he expected to die by being struck by lightning. It was his, uh, the way God would take him home. And sure enough, in May of 1783, he was in his neighbor's, neighbor's doorway, and he was struck by lightning. He is buried at the old Granary Burial uh, site here in Boston, and I'm going to take a short. We're going to take a walk over there in a few minutes. Well, 
here we are as promised at the old Granary Cemetery, which is right in downtown Boston on Washington Street. It is right next to the world famous Park Street Church. And we are looking at the, the final resting place of the body of James Otis. Now, just uh, a few minutes ago, we were at the State House where there's a beautiful painting or fresco, a painting of uh, James Otis giving his writs of assistance speech. And this is where he buried, among other great patriots, John Hancock, Paul Revere, and uh, parents of Benjamin Franklin, and other notable patriots here. Uh, <clears throat> but James Otis, uh, as we might have mentioned earlier, he was struck by lightning May of 1783. And this is a person who should be a whole lot more known in American history because as John Adams basically said, the when he gave that speech, the writs of assistance, that was where the, the, the drive for independence began. And boy, if you're ever in Boston you, and you love history, you want to make yourself, avail yourself of this great uh, location here, this great 